Right, okay. I'm here with Dr. Anna Salter. Anna is a clinical psychologist and consultant to the Wisconsin Department of Corrections, as well as evaluating sex offenders for civil commitment proceedings and other purposes. She lectures and consults on sex offenders and victims throughout the United States and abroad, and has conducted training workshops in all 50 US states and 10 different countries. She is the author of a number of books, both fiction and non-fiction, including the mystery novel Prison Blues, which was nominated for a 2003 Edgar Allan Poe Award for Best Original Paperback, and the non-fiction book, which forms the basis of today's conversation, which is Predators, Paedophiles, Rapists and Other Sex Offenders, Who They Are, How They Operate and How We Can Protect Ourselves and Our Children. Anna Salter, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for inviting me. Right, okay. So, uh, d- diving back into controversial or risky territory, I guess here, but um a very sort of a very important topic. So, we're talking about the uh, I guess I guess that we're talking mainly about the psychology of, of of sex offenders, but I'm also interested in sort of delving into the 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 experience of, of of the victim to a certain extent as well. I mean, I do think that's probably an episode which deserves its its own conversation. But I just like I think this this episode would be a good sort of springboard for that. Um, and it's it's sort of it's all all been sparked off mainly by you know this this Harvey Weinstein scandal, the the, the Me Too movement, and um, yeah. So we've I mean we've covered I've covered we've covered the the topic of PTSD in a past episode. And one of the most interesting aspects of that conversation I had with Dr. Nick Gray, sorry, I can't remember the, the episode number, you're just going to have to um, have a flick through the website. It, we, When we were talking about the uh, mm-hmm. talking about rape and sexual assault in relation to PTSD, it was that part of the conversation that brought up the, the concept of, 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 of malevolence, of human evil, and this idea of, um, the sort of the severity of trauma having a correlation with the proximity in which it's experienced with another human being, and that's that that's what particularly <laughs> interests me about this subject. This idea, this idea of, of evil and um, and the the trauma it causes. So, but as a standard procedure, before we get into all that. Um, if you could just tell the the audience a little bit about yourself, your history, but I'm, I'm very interested in why why this, why specialize it in this topic, why make this a, a career? Well, I never intended to. My plan when I was 14 years old was was to play for the Boston Celtics in the NBA. Okay. Uh, and uh, and I sometimes think if I could go back and tell that kid what I ended up doing, she she wouldn't believe it. Uh, but I, uh, went to school, got my degree, uh, got a PhD, uh, thought I'd specialize in children and just general problems. So this was the late seventies. I never had a course in sexual abuse. I never had a lecture on sexual abuse or any form of child abuse in the five years I spent at Harvard. And I don't think Harvard was unusual at that time. Then I started working at a community mental health center in New Hampshire. And every second kid that came in seemed to be sexually abused, physically abused, or neglected. The the adults came in with a variety of symptoms, depression, anxiety, but a huge percentage of those also had sexual abuse in their background. And I felt unprepared. Uh, I actually had... no real clue how to treat them, but I did figure out that I could adapt the techniques that I had been taught for use with this population until the court started sending in sex offenders for treatment, mandatory treatment. And I had no clue what to do with these guys. So I got a grant. I got a small grant from the state of Vermont, and I went around the country looking at programs that had been treating sex offenders. And I found uh, I, oh I found a uh, program in Washington State that had been going on for 10 years or so and was using very advanced techniques, polygraph, physiological testing. 
So I just started out writing a report for the grant, but it kept growing and it kept growing. And with the permission of the program, Northwest Treatment Associates, it turned into my first book. Uh, when I published it in, uh, I guess, 19, is it 1988, that first book came out, uh, it turned out there weren't a lot of books on sexual abuse in the field. So especially how-to books, how to treat sex offenders. And it just kind of took off. So in a sense, I was stuck. I had gotten in the field totally by accident. Now the, the second thing that happened but I got very interested in it, too. I'm just saying I didn't seek it out. I just kind of fell into it. When I was at the Community Mental Health Center, I got recruited by Dartmouth to Medical Center to be their consultant on child abuse. So I ended up working. Uh, I eventually ended up on the faculty of Dartmouth Medical Center in psychiatry and, and uh, essentially pediatrics uh, and spent all my time on sexual abuse. So this thing just happened. And I think a lot of careers are like that. You you stumble into something by accident and it seems really interesting to you and feel like you can be useful. And there you are. Well, it's one of those, I mean, it's sort of, um, you know, it, it begs the it's one of those fields of, of research and a career that, that, that begs its own questions, like I said, about your how it affects you and your psychology and and your own mental health, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on that for now. We'll we'll, we'll get to that. Um, for now, I think what would be a good a good starting point would be if you could sort of I don't know if this is going to be just US specific or globally, but could you paint us a sort of statistical picture of the of of what we're dealing with here? So the, I'm 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 interested in. Well, just as many sort of statistics you can you can throw at me, really, of of you know how many sexual assaults take place and how many people are convicted and the differences between um, men and male and female sex offenders and just anything you feel would be of relevance to to give us a, a broad picture that we can then sort of unpack a little bit. Well, in the U.S., ten to twenty percent of the of adult women say they were sexually abused as children. Uh, the figure is uh, similar for rape, uh, 12 to 24 percent uh, say they were uh, raped at some point uh, or someone tried to. The, in the case of the children, what is really interesting is uh, the research is pretty clear that the majority do not tell anyone during their childhood uh, I don't know if you want me to cite studies, but according to yeah, a two yeah, of course, yeah. 2005 study by London, uh, uh, this looked at 10 retrospective studies of adults who said uh, in anonymous surveys that they were sexually abused as children. And it turned out that about a third told anybody, but that could be a best friend that they swore to secrecy. So of those reports, only 10 to 18 percent, depending on the study, ever went to police. So as flooded, uh, and any figures I've seen for England turn out to be similar. In fact, uh, I'm working on an update on predators, and I just finished the chapter on rape. And uh, there are, uh, there's a wonderful five-country uh, survey of uh, Australia, England, Canada, the U.S., and Germany. The figures look pretty similar. The interesting thing about rape is that of women in anonymous surveys who have nothing, no secondary gain from lying about anything, uh, only 14% of those on average who say they were raped ever went to police. Okay, now take start with that 14%. It already means 86% of adult sex reports, the sexual assaults, are not reported. And the range is, in the studies that I've seen, is about between 6% and 32%. But the average, 32% uh, is an outlier, and so is 6%. It looks like about 14 or 15% of adult uh, women who are raped ever reported to anybody. 
But then you get what's called the justice gap. That's bad enough. But of that 14%, only uh, 30 so 30% or so are kicked out by police. They never go forward. The bottom line is that only 12% of that 14% are convicted of any crime, and only 6.5% are convicted of a sexual assault. So if you apply that to the entire population, what you find is that crime pays. Only 1% to 2% of uh, sexual of rapes ever result in a conviction. Now, critics of these figures say you you can't say that you're talking about rapists because it could be that one rapist commits a number of offenses. So you're talking about individual rapes. Uh, that's that's actually true. But any way you cut it, <laughs> there is no way to make these figures look like the majority of women or report rape, or that those, uh, the majority or even a sizable minority of those reports ever result in convictions. And this is what's called the justice gap. And there are a couple of really good books about that. Estrich uh, wrote a groundbreaking book in 1988, and there was a very interesting book, uh, I believe they're British authors, by Tim Timken and uh, Crahey in 2009, talking about the disparity between the number of rapes that are committed and the numbers that result in successful convictions. And th frankly, I was in court on this issue yesterday. Okay, so, right, well, I get a couple of things there. Firstly is, um, so th those those statistics that you cite in there, and have we got, have we got a solid a solid definition of, of what we, what we mean by rape. Um, I mean, this is, this is one of those sort of never ending back and forths that are going on now with all the discussions in, in, in like the, the me too movement in the media. Um, you know, se sexual assault doesn't necessarily have to constitute rape in the, in the, in the penetrative sense. Um, but it's, it, so I guess I'm, what I'm asking is, is not so much that, rape necessarily has to constitute penetrative sex, but I'm just wondering what would constitute a sexual assault in... Well, I'll, I'll just throw that over to you. I've got, I feel like we've got to be very careful about what I say here. I'm not the one with it with, who, who knows what I'm talking about. That's why I'm, I'm speaking to you. But what's the... What are our definitions of, of both those for rape and sexual assault that we're working with to paint that statistical picture? Generally, people will define rape as penetration right. of any orifice by an object or a body part. Right. And rape would be, uh, no, I'm sorry, sexual assault. Uh, and, and I should correct myself. Some of the figures I gave you were for sexual assault as opposed to completed penetration. Uh, the sexual assault would be, uh, you know, any kind of unwanted touching. Exhibitionism wouldn't count as an assault. It would count as an exposure. But any kind of unwanted sexual touching would constitute sexual assault. Right, okay. So it's just that, so when you said this, it's 10 to 20% of women claim to have been raped. Are, are we talking about rape or, or sexual assault by those definitions there? About, well, it depends on the study. Right. But, I think the fairest number is about 12% have actually been raped and the higher numbers are for attempted rape. But it does depend on the study. 12% is still... One in 10 women is... So the, then the, ne the next question is, um, and I guess we prob might dig into this a little more later on, but just, again, just to give us something to, to work with. Like you've just mentioned then, um, what was it? Um, only... 12 was it 12 percent on average or 14 percent on average of women actually go on to report this so i'm interested in in why that is why why only why so few women especially when it's you know it's the it's that there's something i know it's all i know it's all fucked up but there's something particularly um malevolent and and and, and disgusting about the about the, the, that sort of rape, the, the, the violent, the, the penetrative rape, as opposed to the, you know, the, 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 
the guy being a bit of a creep and being a bit handsy, especially in those those more violent or malevolent cases, why are women not reporting those especially? Where it's, you know, it's not up for debate whether, you know, and I can understand some women are sort of question themselves and, I, you know, I'm a being over the top and, but with a case like that, it's it's blatantly obvious. But why do those women not come forwards? Well, for a number of reasons, and they're very good reasons. And in uh, some studies, it looks like they don't want anyone to know. Right. People are ashamed of being raped. Yes. Uh, you know, people... People tend to think that the issue is whose fault is something, that if it's not your fault, you shouldn't be ashamed of it. But that's not really how human psychology works. When the Nazis have their boot on your neck, people are ashamed of that. They're ashamed of being victimized, being made helpless. The fact that it's the Nazis' fault doesn't make you feel any better. Uh, so a lot of women don't want anyone to know. Secondly, uh, they don't trust the legal system, and they shouldn't, because in almost inevitably, in the cases I've been in, the victims are on trial rather than the perpetrator. It's right. always right. the victim's credibility that is at stake. Uh, also, they're going to be attacked on the stand, and as somebody who gets attacked on the stand regularly, including yesterday, when I tried to talk about counterintuitive victim behaviors in a rape case, uh, that's a very tough experience. It's tough for professionals. A lot of professionals won't even go to court. And I'm not talking about anything personal. Uh, victims are talking about a very emotional, personal experience. Uh, they also don't, aren't sure they'll be believed. And they often aren't believed. Often police kick these cases out and label them as uh, false reports. Or they say it's a he said, she said, so there's... They're not going to press it forward. So I think women have very good reasons for not uh, taking this to court. I want to see these guys prosecuted. I want to see them brought to justice. But I totally understand. If my daughter were raped, I would think long and hard. If she asked me what she should do, I would think long and hard before I'd advise her to go to court with it. Wow, that's... <laughs> That's um I'm surprised I'm surprised you've said that. No, well, it depends on the circumstances. You can win a rape case with the big four outdoors, a stranger, yep. a weapon, and injuries. You you those cases people understand, but the problem is that's what people think of as rape. Only 11 to 15 percent of rapes are by strangers. The vast majority are acquaintance rapes and date rapes. So if your daughter had been drinking, for example, and somebody took advantage of her when she was too intoxicated to put up a decent fight, would you tell her to go to court? You know she's going to, one, she has no injuries. She's going to be blamed for going to his place or being with him yeah she was drinking and sh and she's been affected by this for sure and she's going to have to go on the stand and survive cross what would you tell your daughter yeah i don't know anna i mean i i mean the, f the first thing i'd say is you know it's um it i'm i'm I, my in, intuition is to say, well, you know, to hell with it. You know, this guy's done this. We're gonna we're gonna do whatever it it, it takes to take him down or whatever. And it, but you know, I don't know if that's just sort of you know me sort of being hypothetically sort of trying to be the heroic dad in the situation. It wasn't it, what what shocked me about you saying that wasn't so much um, from the from the parental standpoint. I just think someone with your experience in this field to have gotten to the point where they've got so little faith in the justice system to work. I think that's just incredibly, incredibly depressing. That's, that's what shocked me about it. And, um, the figures on, on rape victims in the justice system are depressing. There's no way around it. When you're getting 14% of victims are brave enough to go to court and you're getting a 6% conviction rate. There's no way around it. 
But what's, I don't want to be misunderstood. I have nothing but respect for women who take this to court. Mm -hmm. And when, when asked, I go to court with them in, in the sense that I testify all the time, but frequently in sexual assault cases. And I testify about counterintuitive victim behaviors and, and about uh, trying to explain to juries things that they're going to get attacked for that they shouldn't be attacked for because they're normal responses to this kind of situation. So I have nothing but respect for them. And if my daughter were raped and wanted to go to court, I would back her a thousand percent. I'm just saying that the women who don't go to court have good reason uh, yeah. to go to court. Uh, and the problem seems to be not so much the law. The law has made a lot of changes uh, in terms of uh, rape shield laws and the like. The problems are the attitudes of the population. Take, for example, a recent case I had. Uh, this uh, young woman uh, is uh, meets a guy on campus. Uh, he's very nice. He's very charming. Uh, they talk. They exchange numbers. Uh, she ends up spending some time with him over the next couple of weeks. She uh, studies with him uh, several times. She, she's working in a, in a restaurant and he shows up one night and waits for her and they go and study for several hours and then he invites her to his apartment. She goes to his apartment but she tells him from the start on the way, I am not interested in sex this soon. I just want to be real clear. And he acts wounded that she would even consider that he might press her about this. Once the door closes, uh, well, first they do start making out, they start kissing, and then he violently assaults her, chokes her a number of times, rapes her for two and a half hours, grabs her hair, uh, pulls it back, slaps her in the face repeatedly, uh, strangles her until she thinks she's going to pass out, right? And two and a half hours later, he gets up, he acts like nothing is wrong, uh, makes small talk, and she leaves. Now, he sends her a text that says, uh, still alive, which is a pretty creepy text. And she says, uh, laughing my ass off, right? And he says, night, and she says, night, bro. Okay. Juries are not going to understand that. Because he's going to say it was consensual, and look at this text. Yeah, look at this text. If she, if it weren't consensual, she would have run from the room screaming. So the, these are the kinds of things that cause women not to take rape cases forward. Now, in this particular case, this woman did take it forward. She was stunned. She didn't understand what had happened. Uh, she she did went into pretend normal and answered the text. But she talked to family members that night, got reoriented, wrapped her head around it, and, and went to the police. And he, once she did, there was a small avalanche of women coming forward. Uh, and he actually ended up pleading. But if this had been the only woman, going to court with that text would have killed her. Because people don't understand that victims will go into pretend normal mode after a uh, sexual assault by an acquaintance they uh, who may then take them to the movies or ask them for another day. Uh, the, these are what I call counterintuitive victim behaviors, but they're triggered by counterintuitive perpetrator behaviors. So, uh, well, you see, I'd like to, like if you could sort of expand on this um, a little more, Anna, and, and give us, give, give us more examples of it. I think it's this, um, I think that, that these counterintuitive victim behaviors are, um, I think these are things that are sort of often cited in cases in the media where it's like you're saying a text message or some sort of action taken afterwards. And it's like, aha, well, it's obviously the guy's obviously innocent based on this. Um, right. have you got any, have you got any more examples you could sort of run us through there, um, of, of, of counterintuitive victim behaviors? And why, what, what's, what's the driver behind them? Well, let's talk about the driver first. One of the driving forces behind this is that this doesn't occur in 
stranger attacks. It occurs in uh, acquaintance, date, family, family rape, family sexual assault, that kind of thing. And in those cases, there's cases that are a pre-existing social relationship. Now, social relationships have certain built-in norms and expectations. It, you're going to be nice to the person. You don't walk into the office and say, or you don't come downstairs and say, good morning, you son of a bitch. You right. just don't. You, you, how are you? Fine. How are you? There's an expectation the relationship is going to be ongoing. So an altar boy who won't go back is in essence disclosing. He won't continue to be an altar boy. Maybe he's ashamed of what happened to him. And maybe he doesn't want anybody to know. And he thinks he'll it will kill him if the kids at school know. He can't stop going back because if he does, everybody's going to ask him why not. So there's an expectation in relationships that is going to be ongoing. We, if any of us fall down on the street, what's the first thing we do? Yeah, pretend like pretend like you're fine. It, it, it didn't happen. Try and smooth it out. Yeah. Yeah. We jump up. We brush ourselves off yeah. and uh, people try to help us and we say, I'm fine, I'm, I'm fine, really, I'm fine. Mm. Because it's social expectation that you don't make a scene. Sometimes victims don't cry out when people are nearby because of this overwhelming social expectation of not making a scene. There, If you have an ongoing relationship with somebody, they, there's an expectation of status quo, that it will continue as it is, and there's an assumption they wouldn't harm you. If you thought they would harm you, you wouldn't have that relationship with them. So this is one side of the Venn diagram, okay? Now, on the other side is the realities of sexual assault, whereas you are on, in a social relationship, you're assuming they're trustworthy because they haven't raped you before, uh, so you're assuming they're trustworthy or you wouldn't be with them. But they aren't trustworthy. The reality of sexual assault is that they betray trust in someone who, who trusts them. The reality of sexual assault is that they will use an ongoing relationship to get access. The reality of sexual assault is they will use the fact that victims don't want to make a scene and are ashamed of it and don't want other people to know to hide the sexual assault. Uh, the... A reality of sexual assault is that they will harm you, but in date rape or acquaintance rape or boss rape, they'll be nice before and they'll be nice after. They will gaslight victims, act as though nothing is wrong. Uh, do you want to go out Wednesday night or uh, had a great time? You know, see you tomorrow in class, for example. So think of these as two Venn diagrams where these circles intersect is where victims get caught between social expectations and the realities of sexual assault. So the first thing that happens to victims is they want to go back to their normal life. That something has suddenly happened that has uh, overwhelmed them. Uh, they don't understand it. They're wrapping their heads around it, and they will pretend normal as fast as they can. What happened in Boston? What happened in Boston after the Boston... the Bombs blew up at the Boston Marathon. What happened? What did the people of Boston do? Well, I don't, I don't know exactly, Anna. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it was, it was um, similar to um, like situations like we've had, we've had in, in Manchester, and um, people just sort of go back to normal life. Life goes on. Yes, people were resilient. They went yeah. back to work. People with severe injuries got prosthesis and went back to work. People went back to their normal life. People were resilient, and we called it Boston Strong. Right. Oh, Even yes. that's where Manchester Strong came from, and that, it resonated kind of around the world. So everybody said, that's fantastic. It's Boston Strong. But when victims go back to work the next day, when they go to the movies, when they see their friends, we say it didn't happen. That's the difference. They don't get told that they were strong or resilient for doing that. They get attacked in court, and people claim it didn't happen. If it had happened, she wouldn't have gone to work the next day. 
if it had happened, she wouldn't have gone to the movies with her friends the next evening. Yeah, I'm... Well, I guess one thing that's sort of one question that's cropped up there for me is I'm wondering whether this is so. You, like you gave the example of um, of the boss, so the boss has sexually assaulted an employee, and then you know the next day or a couple of days later, they're acting like everything's perfectly normal. Um, is that a is that a manipulation tactic? It, it's, yes, it, it's 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 sort of a. It's a tactic. They 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 go ahead and engage with the person that they've sexually and sexually assaulted in this way purposefully, make, not only to sort of project their own innocence, but to confuse the the person that they've they've assaulted. Yes, they do. It and it's called gaslighting. Uh, and the interesting thing is, what happens in court cases is the victims get attacked for those behaviors that are we now call counterintuitive, but nobody talks about the perpetrator's counterintuitive behavior. So perpetrator counterintuitive behavior induces counterintuitive behavior. I'm working now on a rape case where two college uh, football players raped a young woman who had been a friend of theirs. And then they offered her water and walked her to the car. No. So what's going to happen is she's going to be attacked for not screaming and running. Yeah. I mean, she, and, and now they tr tried to have contact with her the next day. She actually reported right away. She was not as confused as many victims. And when they text her, she didn't text back. But let's. But there are plenty of victims who are that confused. Uh, it, afterwards, it's obvious to the rest of us it's right. But... Uh, at the time, the victim, I have a, in a case where a victim was actually strangled, uh, she wrote a, a text to a family member afterwards and said, describe the whole thing, which anybody could read and go, oh, my God, that's a horribly violent sexual assault. She could have died. At the end, she said, I don't think I'm sexually assaulted, but I feel very weird. Mm. Okay. You have to look at that and go, you don't think you're sexually assaulted? Why don't you think you're sexually assaulted? But look, studies in England and this country and, and uh, in the countries that I've read research on, more than half of the women who have sex through force, intercourse through force or the threat of force, won't say they're raped. Right? They call it miscommunication or people don't want to feel they were raped. It, well, if somebody's strangling you, that is not miscommunication. While you were screaming and crying and telling them to stop, and you never gave permission for any of this, that's not miscommunication. That's sexual assault. That's right. But that's one of the problems is victims often have the same misconceptions that the rest of the public has. Yeah, and they guess... say themselves, if I was raped, I wouldn't have texted afterwards. Yeah, I guess. I mean, see, the re the reason I was asking that whether it's sort of it was it's a, a premeditated technique is, um, I get, I mean, you know, obviously I've never seen like a sexual assault take place, but I've seen I've seen guys interacting with women that have just they haven't got a clue. They've they've got no, they don't seem to have any sort of intuition or ability to pick up on social cues. They're sort of talking to a girl in a bar and being handsy, and and she's obviously, and and not even you know some girls are very polite about guys that are in bars and stuff, and and but some girls it, the look on the face is blatant disgust, it's blatantly get away from me, and it's like the guy can see it. It, it, there's some sort of screen that he can't see it, and so I was wondering whether any of these guys, are, are any of these guys that are doing this sort of thing. As, as well as the, the, the types that it's sort of premeditated and they know they're going to do it and then afterwards they're going to sort of be manipulative. Is there any, is there any guys that are, are sexually assaulting people and that are just so stupid that they, even they haven't got a clue that what they've done yeah. is as bad as it is? Yes, the realities of sexual assault is that uh, people tend to polarise and some people see them as poor lost souls. 
who don't have a clue, and some people see them as malevolent predators. And the reality is that we have a continuum. Yeah. Uh, and, and we do have a continuum. And the kind of guys you talk about tend to be uh, generally more lower functioning. I've seen stranger rapists who have, who have uh, asked them for a date afterwards. Uh, and the victim is astonished somewhat. And I've talked to plenty of offenders who had that fantasy, that they would rape someone and she would be get so into it that she would start going out with them. Uh, okay, that's an extreme uh, example. But I just read an example uh, in a book yesterday from the, I think it was, uh, I think it was the original Ms. Uh, study of sexual assault and rape, in which uh, this guy raped a date, and she was fi finding afterwards, uh, she was fighting the whole time, and afterwards he said to her, do you always fight so much during sex? She said he didn't have a clue that he had just raped her. That's one end of the continuum, but we also have plenty of high-functioning guys who are trying to calm the victim down, they're trying to persuade them that it wasn't rape, that they are um, trying to uh, control the victim's perception of the event. So we have both. Yeah, well, I'm guessing, you know, you know, just by the sort of, you know, like you're talking about the extremes then and, and, and the bell curve of, of, of the, the, the types of, of guys or the, the psychology of the, of, of the guys that do this sort of thing. In 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 the middle of that bell curve, where where most of the of the guys sit, is that what we're talking about of of sort of of, of high functioning, by every other measure, regular guys, apart from the fact that they have this sexual. I was going to say proclivity. I don't, I'm not sure if that's quite the right the right term for it. But is 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 that is that what the bulk of 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 rapists are, it's regular guys by any other measure apart from this? Well, first of all, I don't know that it's a bell curve, and I'm, okay. I'm not sure what we are what we would measure them on, but I, I can tell you that um, stranger rapists, the ones I have seen, tend, tend to be uh, uh, not well-adjusted people. They often have criminal records. They are uh, they're frequently not that smart, although some uh, some are. But that's more unusual. They're pretty maladjusted people. And uh, I I once interviewed six knife wielding rapists in a row, all of whom had backgrounds of neglect. It's like they don't know how to connect with people. Right. Right. Uh, but the date rapists are different. The, the date rapist, the acquaintance rapist, the boss rapist, they do, they tend to be higher functioning people and they can be, uh, and they can be uh, successful at their jobs. Uh, they come across to their friends as nice people. Uh, they have people in court if they ever get hauled into court. Uh, we've seen plenty of uh, sports figures, college football players, you know, people in different sports who have uh, thought they were entitled to rape uh, to rape women, and everybody thought they were a great guy. Otherwise, yeah. It's, you see, what one of one of the chapters in your book is on is on deception, and yes. um, I guess I guess I didn't. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd never, I'd never really had that, like the, that one-dimensional view of of the, the 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 stranger rapist, the guy in the park, and that's that's the only type of rapist. And I, I knew, I knew there was there was guys that the um, what they called the opportunistic rapists, mm -hmm. the the date rape guys, and 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 those sorts of cases. But I was I was surprised to read about this this idea of guys actually setting up. A double life, um, learning to be charming and 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 sort of cultivating this ability to lie for the for the express purpose of facilitating the ability to sexually assault women. That was that's that was a bit of a revelation to me. I've got to say, um, how 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 common is is that where it's sort of a um, where it's where where the, the the sexual assault is sort of the driving force behind the guy's existence, if you like. 
in high risk sex offenders. And that's ma mainly who I deal with. Right. Uh, in high risk sex offenders, it's not rare at all. In high functioning, high risk sex offenders. They, what I point out in my book that made, I think, that made you uncomfortable and that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, including many people in my field, is that malevolence exists. Mm. There, there are people uh, who are uh, malevolent. There was a book called People of the Lie, which pointed this out in example after example. Now, interestingly, the people who find this concept the hardest are religious people. And uh, that surprises me because I sort of want to say to them, you know, if I'm talking to a religious audience, I want to say, uh, look, you guys invented good and evil. That's not a psychological construct. That came from religion. What is it that, where do you think evil is? Uh, somewhere else in hell? You know, but I, I've seen case after case. There's a case in the book. I honestly can't. I think it was in the uh, the first edition. As I said, I'm working on the second. Sometimes I get confused between the new examples and the older ones. It was a case of a correctional officer who got really involved with a, a young inmate. He, the officer was very religious. He got this kid going to classes, religious classes. Uh, and when the when the guy got out, he didn't have a place to live, so he arranged for him to live with him and his wife. Uh, the guy was a child molester, and the officer had a nine-year-old daughter. Officer was trying. The officer and his wife decided to adopt this grown adult. While they are trying to get the adoption to go through, he's molesting the child. Right? I, this was an unusual guy because he was an emotional sadist. His thing was setting people up, and then the thrill he got was when they found out what he'd done. The, he called it a rush, a high. He said uh, he had never been into drugs, but he imagined this is what drugs would feel like. So the, the, the denouement for him was when he was able to say to them, you're idiots. You know I'm a child molester. You deserve everything that happened to you. Okay, that's bad enough. But later, I get an email from a psychologist at the prison that the offender is in, because he did go to prison for that child molestation. And the psychologist says the officer is trying to see this guy. The officer and his wife are trying to visit this guy. And even the offender is amazed. So the offender said, I feel like saying, what the fuck is wrong with you, lady? I molested your fucking daughter. Okay. Now, he got moved to a treatment program, which cut it off. This, but I believe in my soul that had that not got cut off and had he not got uh, tired of toying with them, he could have done the same thing again. And here's, here's the problem with, with many religious people is that they believe everybody can be redeemed. They believe uh, in the parable of the prodigal son. Well, that applies to some people. It just doesn't apply to everybody. They believe that uh, if, if someone uh, confesses their sin and prays, that they're okay after that. They, they don't need to go to treatment. You know what I mean? They believe in confession and redemption, and that all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ, and you're healed. Well, these guys are very happy to say that they've had an epiphany and they believe in, in Christ. And people tell me all the time that religious people, by people, I mean offenders, tell me all the time that they are the easiest people to manipulate. And I want to say that that is, I am not saying that believing in people is a bad thing. I am saying it is a strength of human beings, but the genius of malevolence is that they t use not just our vulnerabilities, but they turn our strengths against us. That's the problem. Well, on the, you know, I suppose sort of along the lines of redemption, um, that redemption sort of uh, sort of brings us on to, um, I guess, like the possibility of treatment. But before we before we go there, one thing I wanted to to ask is. You mentioned this, so there was like a tendency, a sort of a common thread in the history of um, of 
of stranger rapists was this sort of childhood neglect. I'm wondering if there's any, if there's a, a common thread with other types of rapists, with these, you know, the the boss or the the the, the date rape guy. What like what's their deal? Like are, are people are people born this way? Is it is there something in their childhoods? Or I mean, I've got, I've I've got my own speculation on this one that maybe it's got something to do with um, with pornography and the, especially the types of pornography that um, that are sort of going out being put out there at the moment. I've had this conversation with a couple of people in the past. Uh, Wendy Maltz, we talked about pornography, and Gary Wilson, we talked about an addiction to pornography. And in both those conversations, it came up that, um, I mean, just I, I just remember when I was a teenager, when we used to sort of find porn magazines or whatever in a bush, in a park somewhere, and it wasn't readily available. It it was tame, and there was, um, I know in, in general pornographies, um, there's, there's a, I suppose it's subjective, but there's a, I suppose there's a certain level of degradation there, to at least to an extent. But I remember pornography being sort of um, revering women in 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 the, in the strange sort of weird way that porn can. But now you were mentioning this, you know, you mentioning this this slapping women and and choking women and beating women up and stuff. That's almost mainstream now, as far as pornography is concerned. Um, and I'm wondering if if a two prong question really whether there's a a common history. For, for for the guys that aren't the stranger rapists and whether pornography bears any of the responsibility for for this sort of behavior um it seems to me that uh we've had uh child molestation just throughout the centuries uh, every pretty much everywhere and i think that it, it is possible that pedophiles, people who molest kids because they are sexually attracted to kids, and not all child molesters are pedophiles, I think it is possible that this is a sexual orientation for them, not something they ever sought out, but something that at puberty, uh, when other guys were thinking of girls or of other boys, they were thinking of little children. They'd certainly describe it that way. Uh, a rape, it seems to me, is much more cultural. Right. It's much right. more culture dependent, and it, and it has to do with how the culture views women. So the rates of rape really differ according to the nature of the culture. I don't. Uh, so I think rape, where this comes from, uh, is you know has to do with the the culture that we live in. The one thing that seems uh, common to me and the date rapist and the stranger rapist is their sense of entitlement, the sense that uh, that they have the right to uh, to do anything they want, uh, you know, uh, to women. They they really feel entitled. The pornography is a complex question. Uh, when I grew up, it was in an era in which your father's playboy was pornography. Today, some people wouldn't even count that uh, as pornography. It has gotten violent, uh, really violent. And I testified in one case of a guy who abducted and killed a child, and he had managed to find porn that uh, involving dismemberment. And he talked about uh, dismemberment in a sexual way. And I'm like, I'm testifying that that has no meaning to the rest of us. Yeah, you can't put yeah. those two words together and, and figure out, you can't even imagine what he meant. There's no form of dismember that, that would strike most of us as uh, sexual, uh, nauseating maybe, but not uh, sexual. So uh, the figures I see uh, indicate that, or the latest figures I looked at, uh, that 88% of best selling pornography is violent and degrading to women. I certainly, I think, uh, I, I used to think that pornography was a free speech ish, issue. I don't think I understood its effects on people. I am, uh, I prepared a 
So I started doing some talks on this. So I reviewed the literature on pornography and I was really surprised at how much it affected people. I'm not saying by itself it causes sexual offending, but uh, people do get addicted to pornography and it gives them a very different view of sexuality because in pornography, the woman does anything he wants and it is, uh, you know, orgasms uh, all the time and he, and he doesn't have to do anything to please her. Uh, what he is king, right? And it he degrades women, and women look like they love being degraded in in the pornography. And I've had offenders, uh, I've had people say that that was real, that it wasn't fake. I'm like, oh really? Uh, and that's their view of sexuality. And uh, there's a good book, Pornified, on the impact of pornography on regular people that are now. What tends to happen is they lose interest in normal sex. They they become desensitized to it. They also, uh, in one study, I think a third of them ended up divorced because their wives were no longer interesting to them. Their wives didn't look like porn queens. And they were no longer interesting to the wives because they were not interested in the wife's satisfaction. They wanted it to be like a porn script. That, you know... We, uh, we get people who uh, watch pornography all the time and uh, say that it's better than having a partner. Uh, that, as one guy said, and it's better than a partner and all the crap that comes from having a woman in your life. So I think pornography uh, in general that, uh, that it is, uh, has a very bad impact on the normal person. We now have law firms that are specializing in pornography divorces. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, for these really violent guys, uh, I'm not saying that pornography causes this, but they certainly use pornography to reinforce it. I don't think we know where this comes from. It's been very interesting to me how my field, and I suspect other fields, want to have all the answers. So when you when somebody says, uh, you know, where does child molestation come from? People say, oh, they were molested as kids. Hmm. Well, actually, the studies show that if they're told they're going to have to take a polygraph on their answers, the number who say they were molested as kids drops from two thirds to under 30 percent. Just because they're told they have to take a polygraph. Right. So that leaves 70 percent who weren't molested as, as kids. Nobody wants to say we don't know. The, the truth is, uh, I think uh, that pedophiles may have a deviant arousal pattern. I don't think we have the answers to why uh, the other guys molest kids. I don't think we have all the answers as to why uh, men rape women, except to say that it does seem to be heavily dependent on the culture and the culture's view of women. Well, just I suppose following on from that, do you th is there any is there any cultures that can be sort of cited as um, particular like uh, that have got to say maybe the 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 least amount of sexual assault cases and that are also particularly egalitarian or, or anything like that? Is there any? There have been cultures like that, and I've read about them, but I can't give you a good answer on it because I can't remember. Uh, offhand uh, what some of those examples were but there certainly are cultures where there have been more or less rape uh, uh, and some have had very low levels of rape but coming back to this idea of, of, of redemption and um, well I guess treatment in, in, in a more clinical sense um, uh -huh. as Again, we're working with a, a sort of a spectrum here. You know, you imagine the, the 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 sort of the stranger rapist who's who's waiting in parks with a knife is sort of beyond redemption. Um, and then maybe when you get down to, um, you know, the guy that's, um, I don't, I don't I don't even like saying get down to, but move over to the 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 guy that's, um, you know, the date rapist. You can possibly see it, there may be a, a glimmer of hope for that guy that that's just offended the once, 
But is there, you know, is this, it, I mean, maybe stri it strikes me that this is a, a sort of a, a fetish, a paraphilia that sort of, that's hardwired and there's, there's not very much you can do about it. But I don't know, is, is that the case? I don't think the uh, responsiveness to treatment breaks along the lines that you're talking about. Okay. Uh, I deal with high-risk sex offenders. What I do right now is there are civil commitment laws for sex offenders in the states. And if someone has a diagnosis that lends itself to sexual offending, and they're more likely than not to reoffend, they can be held indefinitely after their prison sentence until they have reduced their risk of reoffending, which could be a few years, and they could end up staying there uh, forever. I do annual evaluations for the state of Iowa. I'm responsible for all the annual evaluations of 110 men who are civilly committed. I can't do all of those evals, so I subcontract about half of them. But I interview four or five high-risk sex offenders uh, a month and write 30-page reports on each one of them. The, the guys I see who are uh, the scariest are the ones who have high, are high in psychopathy, who are high-functioning, who look normal, and are good at fooling people, and who take delight at fooling people. One of the things that bothers me is the courts are very happy to keep someone in who is black, toothless, and poor, and low-functioning. But those guys are the easiest to tell when they have made genuine changes because they're not manipulative. So they will act out, act out, uh, you know. Uh, and then when things change, you can tell it by their behavior. The ones who are much harder uh, are the ones who are... Uh, uh, more malevolent. They are planful. They're thoughtful. They tell you what you want to hear. They tell the court what the courts wants to hear. And uh, they're very slick. For example, uh, we had an offender who everybody thought was wonderful. He looked like a college student. He had been a college student. Uh, and he had raped several women. Uh, not date rapes. He had a a uh, technique for coming up to the door as a salesman, he would get in the house and then he, he would rape someone. So he would kind of talk his way in the house. And also uh, he told women that they'd been sent a stripogram. He would actually go to a bar, uh, meet, uh, meet women, uh, find out about their friends and find out where a friend lived. So then he'd go tell the friend that Sheila, he'd have the friend's name sent him. So the women would laugh and let him in the house, and he would rape them. He escapes. They put him on transitional release. I didn't sign off on it. It was before my time. But it, nonetheless, there was no way to – there wouldn't have been any way to stop him because every, he had done everything right. He escapes. So he plans it. He buys a plane ticket. He gets a secret credit card, buys a plane ticket. By that point, he was working in the community and going back to the facility at night, cuts off his ankle bracelet, and takes a plane. They catch him. They bring him back. And uh, the first year, at, you know, six months later, I interview him for his annual, and he wants to go out again. I'm like, there's no evaluator on earth who could put you out right now because you're an escape risk. He then suddenly comes up with a story that he was sexually assaulted at work. And that's the reason he fled. And that he brought it up over and over and nobody would listen to him, so he fled. Okay, group notes say absolutely the opposite. He said everything was going great, he didn't mention anything. The point is, he's likely to get out again because he's gonna sell this story that he was fleeing from a sexual assault. There is there's a lot of evidence there was no uh, sexual assault. That's a scary guy. Mm. That's a scary mm. guy because he's smart and manipulative and he is uh, a person of the lie. He is somebody who gets a thrill out of duping people and scaring people. So the stranger rapist is not the hardest to treat. The hardest to treat is the person who sees it as a game 
who sees it as uh, if I fool you, then uh, then I feel better about myself. Then I win. Yeah, well, I guess then that I guess that begs the question of how often a a guy's because you know a guy like that doesn't want to be treated. You know, that's the the whole the 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 cat and mouse of it. I suppose is 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 the thrill of it. How how often a guy's sort of genuinely remorseful that sort of you know that maybe I don't know I mean I'm not trying to I'm not by any means trying to foster any sort of sympathy for it but I'm wondering if there's you know how many of these guys have sort of feel trapped in a trapped with this sort of sort of chained to this sexual beast if you like that they can't control and that they're genuinely remorseful about the behaviors there are, there are definitely guys like that. And again, it's a continuum. What I typically find is that the guys who have a conscience, have a fully developed conscience, have a lot of thinking errors. And that's, I call thinking errors such as she wanted it, she loved it, he was, the little boy was erect. If he hadn't been erect, if he hadn't wanted it, he wouldn't have been erect. Uh, she came back uh, to see me, uh, therefore she must have wanted it. No, uh, the, I call thinking errors uh, oxycodone for a conscience. They mm-hmm. medicate a conscience. Uh, and these are often guys who uh, want to believe that they're not preying on anybody. They want to believe that it's a mutual thing with children. So they medicate their conscience. On the other end, the, the, the guys without any conscience, they don't even make thinking errors privately. I mean, they may tell the court. Uh, that you know that they thought it was education or something, but uh, many of them uh, will just flat out say uh, uh, to fit me. I was training her to fit me. Uh, I I make educational films, or I've made a couple of educational films that include guys talking about how they fool people and what their motivations were and so forth. And uh, one of the guys. The really malevolent guys will just say, uh, well, she was going to do what I wanted her to do. They don't pretend that it's something that's good for the kid or that the kid's not going to remember it. They don't care. That group seems to scare people. They just really don't want to hear about that group. You said my book was dark. My book is dark. Mm -hmm. But I think what makes my book dark is because I talk about the guys that intend the small minority of sex offenders who really intend to hurt people and take pleasure in it. Yeah. I mean, I've got one of the, one of the quotes from a guy in your book that sort of stood out to me. Um, I think he said, he said something along the lines of um, even if he was deeply religious and believed that his actions would result in him being um, swallowed by hell, he knew that he still couldn't stop himself. And that's, I mean that's yeah it's intense it's intense. Um okay I just want he, to, sorry he could have stopped himself he didn't want to. Right okay. Okay. He, he enjoyed it so much he wouldn't have stopped himself. Now, I agree with you. That quote made the hair stand up on the back of my neck when he said it because I didn't understand the compulsivity behind it until he said that. But I wouldn't say these guys aren't psychotic. They're very few, very few who are psychotic. They, uh, they, they are capable of stopping themselves, but uh, well, that, that makes it, that makes it, that makes it even more harrowing and even, even worse. I mean, I think I must've read that quote as in, you know, there was just, the, there was a sexual drive there that's overtaken him, but to, to flip that around and be someone that says, even if I knew I'd be, you know, swallowed by hell, I'm still going to consciously go ahead and do what I want to do anyway. Just, just makes it even worse. Um, okay, Anna, I want to just sort of uh, um, move across to talk about the the the, the victims now as as we're sort of closing up. Um, I'm interested in whether there's a again. I, I don't suppose this is going to count with the, the the stranger sort of attacks, but is there is there a particular type of woman who tends to be vulnerable? to sexual assault or who tends to be targeted by sex offenders and I guess you could approach that from maybe both a statistical standpoint um and from a from a personality standpoint as well I guess well we know that being molested as a child 
is a risk factor for uh, re-victimization as an adult, that people who are molested as children have a higher rate of re-victimization as adults. Do we know why that is? Uh, probably uh, because child sexual abuse has an impact on people. Yeah. <laughs> and they are uh, less confident as a group, or they might be depressed, mm. more depressed. Uh, I'm not saying everybody is vulnerable. I, I want to say two things. First of all, anybody can be raped. You can be walking down the street and someone can drag you in and, and rape you. And also you can be a perfectly normal college student who just meets somebody uh, and they sound and look legit and uh, nothing bad has ever happened to you. And you're just totally surprised by it. So I, I don't want to say that, uh, that there's only one type of person that is sexually assaulted because all types of uh, women are sexually assaulted. The biggest risk factor is actually age. Younger women are overwhelmingly sexually assaulted uh, over older women. So it's uh, it's one of the only good things about growing older is you're less vulnerable to sexual assault. But I will say that statistically, women who have been traumatized as children uh, are more likely to be sexually assaulted. And I think that's just because uh, women who are traumatized as children, many of them have mental health issues to overcome and they may uh these guys if they see someone they think is vulnerable they'll definitely go after them yeah and one of the one of the sort of i guess it was uh, sort of upsetting to read was even even though it's, it's sort of obvious that this is going to happen you, your chapter on you're talking about um positive illusions and, and the trauma-based worldview um, a, a sort of the, the, the effect that being assaulted can, can have on victims. Um, how, how that ties into the previous question, I was, I was wondering whether, um, and I don't mean this in a, in, a, in a disparaging sense, I wonder if, we talked about this in, in the PTSD episode and, and trauma, whether naivety has any sort of bearing on the the effects that this sort of this sort of thing can can, can have on a woman um and i was wondering whether naivety maybe had had anything to do with why uh, how how a, a rapist would target a woman in the first place but i guess we've already sort of covered that is that they can be so purposefully deceptive that even the most you know astute of women is not going to is not going to pick up on it. the the reason I, the, the reason I bring up this concept of naivety, Anna, is so I for for, for a time my listeners will know this um, in my early to late twenties, I was involved in the uh, in the sex industry to the extent that I worked as the, like a driver and a chaperone for girls that worked in the escorting industry. So it was my job to look after them um, and 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 make sure that clients behave themselves, if you like. And one of the, um, the I mean, the, there's, di there's different levels to it. When I when I was in my late twenties, it was the sort of sophisticated agent, sophisticated agencies, if you like, and there wasn't very much trouble that happened. But in the early days, when I was sort of working at the bottom of it, there was there was girls there that. I don't know if it, the reason they were there or whether working there had shaped this view, but they just didn't, they didn't trust men. They didn't like men. Um, they had a very sort of, they had a very sort of negative view and a very um, suspicious view of the world and of men in particular. And they would tell me of stories of being sexually assaulted, either in or outside the job. And it meant nothing to them. It, that, it was, that's just what men do. And they weren't traumatized by it. Because that's just that's just what men do. Men are disgusting, and so because to an extent they expected that of men, they weren't traumatized by the experience, and and so yeah, I'm well, I'm just wondering if, if that if that bears if that bears any sort of um, well, well, go on, first, I'll, I'll throw that over to you. Yeah, first of all, I, I would probably disagree with you if you can't stand half the population that because you've been assaulted and treated so badly, that's a, that is being traumatized. If you don't like men and you think they're all pigs, uh, that's 
a more that comes from trauma. That's not a normal, healthy view of half the population. Right. Yes. Yes. So that is a form of trauma in and of itself. I and mean, their their worldview has already been shattered. They're not uh, seeing that they're good men and bad men, good women and uh, and bad women. They they have lost the, the kind of hopefulness and ability to uh, discern people that characterize healthy relationships. So you're talking to, you're talking about a traumatized population to to begin with. Yeah, I've now, never I've, you know what Anna, I've never really thought of it like that. I mean, I've always known um I've, I've, I've it, I mean, it seems blatantly obvious. I've always not you know, we had the conversations I had with a lot of them girls, they they they'd had trouble pasts and things like that, but it was you know, after this this first negative uh, uh, this first sexual assault takes place after they've already had this this past this this sort of depressing childhood or or whatever and it didn't affect them but i'd never yeah i guess i'd, I'd never really i'd considered they were already sort of had a, had a, a dark view of the world but i guess i hadn't already conceptualized it as they've already been traumatized i've never thought of it like that they have been traumatized and when you say future uh, future sexual assaults they just shrug them off well, what you're saying is that they have developed a dissociation not a cognitive dissociation but a uh, split between their bodies and the rest of themselves they they sex has lost its meaning for them yep it, it, it's lost the human intimacy and the warmth and it's uh, they see themselves as plumbing uh, and that's a form of trauma when when you have lost that view of sexuality and you see it as a, you know just a, a plumbing function or something. So yeah, I would say that you are dealing with a population that has been traumatized and that future trauma will reinforce that uh, for them. But that uh, when you're desensitized to sex and it has no meaning for you anymore, that's the aftermath of trauma. So yeah, again, well, that's it. Along those lines, I'm guessing. I guess, yeah, my original question was really that: um, is there a? Is it? I mean, I guess I'm guessing it's it's universally a traumatic experience. But is the? I mean, we're sort of sort of moving into the the sort of what to do about it here because it's, you know, the, these situations. There's very little that a woman can can do about it. But I'm I'm sort of interested in how it how it's dealt with afterwards and you know what's the the the, the prognosis for, for for a woman that's that's been through that and and sort of the best way for them to deal with it because you know some women I've got a I've got a a, a, a woman very close to me that is that was raped and raped in the, in the definition of the sense that we've been using today and it didn't destroy her you know what I mean Whereas with some women, it does destroy them, and I'm just wondering, do do we know why why that tends to be? Why some women it it, it breaks them, and, and other women it it doesn't, and and the women that it doesn't break, what what do they what are they doing that's strengthening them or galvanizing them? I couldn't answer that, right? Because I don't know, but I I can say that the prognosis for women who have been raped is is really very good that uh, the first issue is the first thing that matters is do they have social supports and that may be well be a difference between women who who find it hard to overcome and women who are successful in overcoming it because uh, the, the the opposite of malevolence is intimacy and the, the opposite of a lack of trust or inability to trust people is people you can trust so being able to turn to people uh, is very important in a situation like that yeah. secondly uh, I would say we need to listen to these women uh, about what about this has been hardest for them for example People have, uh, juries find it very hard, as I've said, to convict people in acquaintance rape cases, uh, especially if they have ever had sex with the person even 10 years 
before one time. I, I'm not kidding. That's actually a vignette and a study, and people blame the rapist less and the victim more in that vignette than they did in a stranger rape. So people say, well, they've had sex with them before. What, what's the issue? Only in the last few years have we had a body of research develop on betrayal trauma. And now we have, we have a growing body of research that says the sense of an acquaintance or a former lover or a partner or somebody you know turning on you uh, like that and, and raping you, yes, it less often, it may less often result in PTSD, but it results in a whole different cluster of problems that we call betrayal trauma that uh, the world doesn't make sense to them. They don't trust their own judgment anymore. Who can, who can they, you know, who can they turn to it? Said. So uh, we need to listen to victims about what, what actually, how, how is this affecting them? And then for uh, treatments, uh, we do have therapists who are well-trained now in trauma treatment. It's finally a real specialty. And I think someone uh, who wants to seek counseling should go to someone who has had training in counseling survivors of, of sexual abuse. But I also want to say that the research is really interesting on meditation and yoga, uh, because part of what happens to people is the brain goes on red alert. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, trauma can actually change the brain. So can meditation in the opposite direction, whereas trauma produces alarm, anxiety, and depression, meditation produces peacefulness, calm, and a sense of wholeness. So I wouldn't say that the talking therapies are the only way to go anymore. I, I would say that meditation and yoga uh, and exercise uh, play, can play a huge role in healing from trauma. But uh, while, while, while I am skeptical of how the courts are, and the juries are handling these cases and whether very many, uh, the statistics show that most of women don't get justice, uh, I am not skeptical of the impact of treatment on trauma because I, I think I'm very, I know I'm very hopeful that adult survivors often, most of the time, can do well and can recover completely i guess um yeah i guess what well, one of my final questions is going to be you know obviously it's better to be able to sort of prevent this sort of thing from happening in the first place yeah um is is there any sort of practical steps it sounds a bit self-helpy and a bit weird asking this question but but is is there anything that a woman can do to minimize the risk of being of of being assaulted, being sexually assaulted. Uh, first of all, you could be assaulted just walking down the street. Yeah. So when you start talking about ways to prevent it, some women take that as, uh, oh, this is you know, this is uh, if I was raped, it must be my fault. I don't believe that at all. Uh, but I do talk in the chapter on positive illusions about a kind of naivete, and maybe this is what you were driving at earlier, about malevolence. That uh, I see young women who go on uh, social websites and go out with men that they have only chatted with on the, you know, through the computer. And I would say, don't meet these guys privately. Uh, if you're if you're actually meeting someone you don't know, tell your roommate where you are. <laughs> Bring your roommate with you to mm. meet them the first time, so that th these guys know that the, somebody has seen them and knows what they look like. Uh, I do think that uh, women have to be self protective. It's not going to solve all of the rapes. It's not going to keep a boss from raping somebody, for example, or a producer. Uh, but it can help. Uh, you always have to consider the possibility of uh, that someone means you harm and that you really have to recognize that you're not going to be able to spot them, that they're not going to look different. They're going to look like a nice, charming guy. 
who just wants to have a drink with you. So I do believe that people have to consider uh, both sides in that kind of situation. Yeah, he may be Prince Charming and the best thing that ever happened to your life. Also, he could be a serial date rapist who picks women through Tinder or Plenty of Fish or any of the other websites out there. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's such a it's such a sort of a vague sort of input because obviously we can't go around. You, you can't go around suspecting every single person that you bump into is is potentially going to be a be a rapist. I mean, that's no way. That's no way to live. I, I mean, I, I guess a more practical question then would be: um, in the unfortunate event that something like that happens, and we were talking about this before with the the, the difficulty in 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 scoring a conviction um sort of it feels weird asking this question is there anything is there anything a woman can do during the act or immediately after which increases the chance of 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 getting a conviction like you know this has happened it's happening to me there's nothing i can do about it now but you're not fucking gonna get away with this is there, is there anything that a woman can do at the time or immediately after to to, to nail the bastard, basically? Well, first of all, I don't mean to say that you should walk around thinking everybody is a rapist. Yeah. I do believe that trust can be well-founded when it, it is really unlikely that an old friend is going to rape you. But I do think that the risk is higher for new acquaintances and you and people you've never met before or don't know well or don't know their friends or can't trace them. And I think those are situations where you should be particularly uh, uh, cautious. Uh, you know, it, it's ironic, but the best thing uh, you can do in a date rape situation is act like it's a stranger rape. Don't be nice to him afterwards. Get out of there. Uh, you know, it, Make a scene, uh, scream, uh, you know, uh, don't just uh, drift away and say, uh, see you. Uh, act like it was a stranger rapist to make it absolutely clear that this wasn't cons uh, consenting uh, in any possible way. Uh, if you're going to report it, uh, if even if you don't think you're going to report it, get a saint, get an exam at a hospital where they'll preserve the evidence in case you change your mind. Because they uh, hospitals, at least in the state, will do that now. They'll do a rape kit, and, and you still have the decision in your hands of whether you're going to go forward with it. If, if I was raped, I would go forward with it. I'm like you. I may be protective of my children, but for myself, the the overwhelming desire would be to nail the bastard. Uh, and I would want to go forward with, uh, with it. And I encourage women because I'd like the, I'd like to see all of these guys, uh, caught that do it. I I'm only saying that I do understand women who, who don't go forward because there are problems with the legal system, but act like it's a stranger rape and do the kind of things you would do if it was a stranger rape. Right. Okay. Okay, Anna. So we're coming up on um, coming up on our ninety minutes now. So um, we're about to sign off here. Jump into the the quick fire questions, which are only available to supporters of the podcast. But before we do, as always, Anna, um, have you got any um, any links, websites, projects, books, anything anything you'd like to promote to the to the listeners? Um, feel free to to plug away now. I'm finishing a new edition of Predators. It'll go in in September, I hope. And uh, that should be out, uh, I, my guess is, by next spring. Uh, thus far, I'm happy with it in the sense that I've included uh, a lot of new information about rape, about counterintuitive victim behaviors, about things that weren't in the original books. So I'm able to build on that base. Uh, I do think if you've got naive friends, show them the film Truth, Lies, and Sex Offenders, which is the training film that I made, and because uh, it's the sex offenders themselves talking about how they get access to kids and, and how they fool people. So those are the, uh, you know, those are the two things that I hope are useful resources for people. Okay, and um, do you do social media or anything like that? 
I have a website, AnnaSalter.com. Yeah. And is it, the, the, the film you just mentioned, is that is that publicly available or is that just for purchase? That's that's for purchase. I took it back from Sage Publications because they charge too much uh, for it and I sell it through the website. Right, okay, well, um, as always, I will include um, a link to those on the on the website and the show notes, myownworstenemy.org. Um, right, okay, so... Quick fire questions. As usual, you all get the first one. You get the first one free, but if you want to listen to the rest, you have to become a supporter. Um, you won't be able to do that for the for the for the next week or so. I've shut down membership on on the website for now. I'm going to be moving over to Patreon, and I'll I'll let you you guys know when that's ready. Um, so, okay, and unlike the the previous quick fire questions, which were all the the same ones every week, we're sort of doing a, a bit of a a sort of academic truth or dare with this one, Anna, where I pick 50, we've got 50 random questions and I'm just going to pick them out at random for 10 minutes, 10 minutes on the clock. Um, any you don't want to answer, just say skip those. You don't, there's, okay. there's no forfeits or anything. You just have to sort of, um, I need to, I need to think of some sort of forfeit for wimping out of the questions. Um, <laughs> but I haven't got any yet. So you, you're okay. You'll get away with it for now. Um, okay. But start with the first one, 10 minutes on the clock. So, the last book you read, the best book you've ever read, and a book recommendation on this topic, please. I don't know the best book I've ever read, but I've always uh, loved Pilgrims uh, at Tinker's Creek by Annie Dillard. Uh, the beauty of the writing is just incredible, and I've always loved Joan Didion's uh, essays, particularly the one on self-respect. Her essay on self-respect is just Phenomenal. Okay. The last book you read? Oh, I've been working lately, so the last book I read was The Justice Gap by Timken and and Crahey. Uh, there. Well, that was one you've already mentioned in, in, in the interview previously, yeah? Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, of course your own book, Predators, but have you got a, a book recommendation on, on this particular topic be it you know rape sexual assault men's behaviors or anything anything along those lines oh man there's a lot of books uh for people who think they've come into contact with someone who doesn't have a conscience, i would really recommend bob's bob Hare's book without conscience uh yeah i'd be hard pressed to come up quickly with the best books on rape or sexual assault. I don't know any good books on counterintuitive victim behaviors, which is really scary to me. Uh, From this topic, I also look at uh, Jennifer Freight's work, although uh, she's got a book called Betrayer of Trauma, for example, because I think it's a whole different field that has sprung up in the last few years, and I think it's very important. Uh, so that's my answer. Okay, here we go. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh. Ross Chite's book is incredible, where he went back, uh, he went back to uh, the big daycare cases, and he ch- and did a phenomenal amount of research on them and. Uh, the witch, so-called witch hunt cases. And uh, w- what emerged was that there was probably abuse occurred in, in a lot of them, maybe not to the extent that people thought, but there was evidence of abuse. And uh, that's Ross Chite's book, The Witch Hunt Narrative. That's the name of it. That's a phenomenal book. I definitely recommend that. Okay. Right. What qualities do you admire about yourself? Well, uh, you know, honestly, the first one that comes to mind is persistence. Okay, folks, if you enjoyed this episode or you're enjoying this podcast in general and you'd like to help support it, there are a number of ways you can do so. You could make a a one-off donation for as little as a pound, Or if you'd like a little something in return for your investment, just £2 a month will get you access to exclusive content, including a monthly AMA or Ask Me Anything episode. Just go to myownworstenemy.org forward slash support. 
If you can't afford to make a donation, there are a couple of other ways you could help us out that won't cost you much more than a couple of minutes of your time. Firstly, you could leave us a positive review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, as it's called nowadays. Just search for My Own Worst Enemy Podcast, open the Reviews tab, and then click Write a Review. Um, I think that's what it says you have to do on Google anyway. I don't know. I don't use iTunes. But yeah, that's a, a good way of encouraging people to give us a listen. You can leave us a positive review on our Facebook page. That's always very much appreciated. Just go to facebook.com forward slash my own worst enemy ORG. Uh, you don't have to actually write a review either. If you can't be asked, just click on five stars and I've done with it. Or four. Uh, four stars is fine. Any less than four, I'd rather you didn't bother, to be honest. But, you know, it's up to you. Do what you want. If you'd rather not be so public about your endorsements, you'd rather just sort of blow smoke up my ass in a more private setting, that's fine as well. Just drop me an email, which is uh, danny at myownworstenemy.org. Or if you're really old fashioned, you, you don't do iTunes, you don't do Facebook, you don't do email, just tell somebody, you know, good old fashioned word of mouth, that always works as well. Uh, so yeah, that's enough validation seeking for one day, methinks. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again next time.